film? Ready, Mr. Dalton. Roll it. Even in a century of technical wonders, television was remarkable. If live moving pictures traveling through the sky to our homes were not a miracle, what was? Okay, my time was running low. Those early images, grainy and colorless as they were, reached out and pulled us into a world that seemed more interesting than our real lives. We moved the furniture and made a place for our new television set in the living room. Every evening, the entire family would gather in front of it and watch. No one had ever seen such a thing before, and then suddenly it was everywhere. It grew overnight from a novelty to a necessity. There was hardly time to ask, what should we do with this incredible invention? There was an experiment. Today we call it public television, and much of its early history began in St. Louis. Produced by KETC. On September 20th, 1954, KETC, channel number nine as it was called, broadcast its first flickering signal to little fanfare and practically no audience. That it ever became more than an idea is as miraculous as television itself. Its survival, in spite of the odds, and sometimes in spite of itself, is the story of a vision made real and the community that made it possible. was over. But peace would bring changes even more profound. St. Louis, along with the rest of America, was trying to return to normal, as life was before the war. But the world had crossed into a new age, and there would be no returning to what had been. We didn't understand how things that seemed so small at the time would change our lives so much. On February 8, 1947, television station KSD Channel 5 signed on the air to a handful of television sets. And suddenly, we could bring this new world into our living rooms. You go out and you get your so-called low price that you think is so low. When Steve Miserani began selling television sets in the late 40s, he couldn't keep up with the demand. We didn't have the TV, we only had one on display, and we put their name down, and, what, and, and uh, we'll call you whenever we get the screen. What brand? They didn't care what brand it was. All they wanted to know is give me a TV. The rush for station licenses was so great that in the fall of 1948, the Federal Communications Commission imposed a 90-day freeze on applications, which was extended until 1952. There were questions. A machine in every home that could receive sound and pictures could impact the very fabric of American life. What kinds of programs would it deliver? And who would control it? Procter & Gamble's new Golden Fluffle. Fluffle, it's really different. It's Most Americans understood television as radio with pictures and expected it, like radio, to provide entertainment as a hook to sell products. But some saw a chance to reserve a small corner of this new medium for other purposes. What if there were a channel that offered you the chance to get an education, learn about issues in your community, or enjoy a concert? No one understood that better than Frida Hennock, the Joan of Arc of educational television. Hennock was as charming as she was abrasive, striking, brilliant, prone to wear big hats and make dramatic entrances. And like President Truman, who appointed her the first female FCC commissioner, she feared no man. Born in Poland, Hennock, as many immigrants, valued education and saw television as a way to bring it to everyone. She bullied, charmed, and cajoled her fellow commissioners and anyone else who would listen to support the idea of reserving channels for educational television. 
1951, the FCC sent a letter to the mayors of major cities, including St. Louis, asking if a channel were reserved for educational television in their city, would they use it? The idea appealed to St. Louis Mayor Joseph Darst, who created a committee of local educators to come back with an answer. He said, if there were a television station which could bring to people the big issues where they could get both points of view or all points of view, it could be like a light for our whole city. Young businessman Ray Whitkoff chaired the committee. I had two qualifications. I had no connection with education and I had no connection with television. But I got excited about this the more I thought about it. It seemed to me to have enormous possibilities. No one on the committee wanted the responsibility or expense of a television station. So they proposed creating an independent commission to hold the license, a body that would represent the entire region. That idea became known across the country as the St. Louis Plan. The report back to the mayor was mixed, a kind of yes but. Surely an educational station would be good for St. Louis, but it would have to be supported by some kind of national network. Mayor Darst asked Whitkoff to organize a national meeting in St. Louis to see if it could be done. In January of 1952, educational television advocates from 28 cities met at St. Louis's City Hall and resolved unanimously that a strong national network of educational stations ought to be created. Well, there were two newspapers in St. Louis at that time. Both of them reported on the meeting the next day and each made the same mistake. They thought that the decision had been made to set up the network. As a matter of fact, we had no resources at all. We didn't have enough money there to buy lunch for our guests. The paper's mistakes were a blessing, encouraging bigger players to get involved. Nobel Prize winning physicist and Washington University Chancellor Arthur Holly Compton granted land for an eventual studio on the campus and temporary use of the women's gym at McMillan Hall. St. Louis University President Father Paul Reinert offered to share his school's tower and transmitter. The St. Louis Public Schools pledged financial support for the production of educational programs which would be broadcast to schools. In April of 1952, the FCC set aside channels for over 200 educational stations. In December, the St. Louis plan became more than a plan, with the creation of the body that would govern Channel 9 for the next half century. Members of the St. Louis Educational Television Commission represented the city, the county, and a variety of civic and cultural organizations. Washington University employed young television producer Charles Guggenheim, who was charged with hiring staff, purchasing equipment, creating programs, and putting St. Louis's educational television station on the air. At that point, no one knew what public television was. I was very happy to do it. I, I had been and I say in retrospect, very lucky to be. I was in commercial te television at its birth in New York. I worked th three years for a very successful independent television producer, probably the most successful at the time in New York. So I learned an awful lot. But I had come out of World War II, and I didn't think I wanted to spend my life dealing with advertising people. The new station would need a name. Guggenheim suggested the board submit five sets of call letters to the FCC, which granted St. Louis KETC for Educational Television Commission at Channel 9. Idealism and cooperation had taken the effort far. Now some money would come in handy. Lots of money. The Ford Foundation was pledging to match money raised by cities to build educational TV stations. Arthur Baer, president of Sticks, Bear and Fuller, offered a gift large enough to secure those matching funds. Additional donations came from various corporations and foundations. City and county schools committed one dollar per student to support educational programs. A Mother's March for Channel 9 brought in more than one hundred thousand dollars from door-to-door solicitations. We were out in, in, in the front 
lawn where the children were playing, and my, and my neighbor on the left of us came by. She says, they're thinking of building a new a TV station, a Channel 9, I think they're going to call it. And they're all looking for, for people to donate whatever they, they can. And I said, what, do you have, what are you soliciting for? How much you? Well, she says, we're giving 20. Do you think you can swing that? I says, oh, sure. I wasn't going to let her think I couldn't afford $20. <laughs> well, anyway. Mrs. Lena made the donation in the name of her two sons, John and Vincent. Everybody thinks I'm, I'm, I spoil my two boys. And, uh, but anything that I could give in this world that would benefit them, I'd lay down my life for them. It was just anything I could do for them. And I thought, I don't care what it costs, I'm going to do this for them. And, uh, and I'm sure that later on they'll appreciate it. And that's really why I did it. I think about anything else but the two of them when I did that. It looked as if St. Louis might launch the first non-commercial educational television station in the nation. Station manager Guggenheim led a talented crew of young producers, including Mayo Simon, who would enjoy a long career in New York and Los Angeles writing for television, movies, and the stage. There was a tremendous amount of energy. You could feel it. They were young and excited. They thought this was, you know, this was the new thing. People are, television is really is taking over, and people are sitting there in front of their TV sets going, <laughs> looking at a lot of ads. So uh, they were excited about it, and it was lots of fun. Guggenheim and his staff ordered equipment, designed a permanent facility, created shows, and waited for the station's commission to raise more money. Highly creative and uncompromising in the quality of his productions, Guggenheim's vision of educational television was a grand one, demanding skillfully shot and thoughtfully edited programs on the arts, science, history, and social issues. Even as money and equipment were slow to arrive, Guggenheim and his producers moved ahead, recording programs on Kinescope, an early method of recording television programs for eventual broadcast. Commission members objected to the expenses. Guggenheim grew increasingly frustrated, trying to communicate with board members who, it seemed, didn't understand what it took to produce television in a studio that was, well, less than ideal. It was a woman's gym that I think was probably less than 100 feet long, had large windows on the side, which you could hear every, all the noise from the play field outside. And I guess I told you the story before, but one of the board members, executive board members, whose name will be, who will be nameless. When I went to the board meeting once, I said, you know, we, we got this item. And they said, what's this item for? He said, we, we need to, 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 to close those windows up and, because we're getting noise into the studio. And, he says, and one of them said, well, why do you need to spend so, couldn't we do it less expensively than that? I said, well, it's not very much money, but he says, but it's money. I said, that's true. He said, why don't you just hire a student to stand outside and say, shh. KETC's hope of being the first educational television station in America was lost in May of 1953 when KUHT in Houston signed on the air. Tension between Guggenheim and board members, largely over money and vision, grew until July of 1954, when the board fired him. It was a terrible blow. He had no idea this was going to happen to him. And he stood out in, in the in front of the McMillan Hall with tears rolling down his cheeks, saying, I'm never going to, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, and we all said, you're going to start your own business and you're going to do all right. Charles Guggenheim went on to become one of the century's greatest American filmmakers. Today, his monument to the dream is viewed daily by thousands of visitors to St. Louis's Gateway Arch. Years later, while visiting Channel 9, he was gracious. I think we really scared them, and probably rightfully so. I mean, I would guess that's true. It's easy, you know, I think people like to say, well, you know, he was fired, then he went off and did good work and therefore aren't, weren't they dumb. I'm not sure they were dumb. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm not giving them a lot of credit for being imaginative or, being, or going, at the, going at the future of television in the way it deserved to be. I think St. Louis very early, but now of course it's come into its own, but I think very early could have been a much bigger player. 
KETC was scheduled to sign on in a matter of weeks. Public relations firm Fleischman Hillard loaned one of its top creative people, Martin Quigley, as temporary station manager. Ironically, he had to rehire Guggenheim long enough to help him put the station on the air. On September 20th, 1954, a small group of supporters gathered in the McMillan Hall Gymnasium to sign on America's eighth public television station. There were likely more people in the studio than there were viewers throughout the entire region. At 8.55, the test pattern was broadcast. At 9 p.m., General Manager Quigley welcomed viewers to Channel Number 9. After a few appropriate remarks from Dr. Arthur Holly Compton, Channel 9 aired The Second Opportunity, a play about free thought. It was really the best of, of St. Louis, the best and the brightest of St. Louis coming together for something new, getting it off the ground, and, uh, and it worked. Financing was always a problem. Fundraising was always an issue. Uh, so it was always contentious, and yet it was always very creative and, uh, and very good. It was a night to celebrate, but no one at KETC was completely certain of just what they had created or how they were going to keep it alive, but they got it on the air, against the odds, in spite of themselves, and as grassroots an effort as the launching of a television station could ever possibly be. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.